All right. Welcome to our interview with Mr. Harold McAleer. I'm Joanna Stoll, a student at Tufts University, completing an interview for Engineering Management 51. So. Also, I happen to be your grandfather. That's true. That is how we are acquainted with one another. Um, the topic of discussion today is engineering management. And since Harold was an engineering manager at GenRad Correct. in his prime, <laughs> I figured, well, he has a second prime now. So <laughs> in one of his two primes, I figured... Um, I would pick his brain. Um, so describe your education and background. All right, my high school education was in a Jesuit high school in Boston, BCI, and uh, it had a strong classical content and language. Uh, four years of Latin, two years of German, two years of Greek, and a, a classical uh, education as opposed to a technical one. Mm -hmm. uh, but it stood me in good stead. I, I value that very much. But then to college, I joined the dark side and went to MIT mm -hmm. uh, in electrical engineering. Okay. This was before the days of computer science, so it was a single department, electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. Uh, four years would lead to a bachelor's degree, but I opted for the five-year master's degree program, which included co-op work. Oh. And as a co-op, you would spend one term in school, one term at work. So it took five years, but you went through the summer, so you had to complete coursework. And I co-opted at a company up the street from MIT called General Radio Company, which made electronic test gear and uh, uh, gear to test components. In those days, uh, before integrated circuits, you had separate components, resistors, capacitors, inductors, mm -hmm. and vacuum tubes. And they were all combined into electronic circuits. So that, uh, and Genrad made equipment to test all those devices oh. used by other manufacturers to test their products for the incoming inspection of components. Oh. And uh, so that was over the course of five years. I started as a freshman in 48 mm -hmm. and, and again sophomore in 49 and then began the co-op program mm -hmm. in 1950 at General Radio Company. And as an aside, it was there I met the lady who became my wife. Wow. Thank goodness. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Your grandmother. Wow. And uh, so that's my education, a master's degree in electronics. Okay. And I went to work at that same company before serving in the U.S. Army Signal Corps for a couple of years. Oh, wait, so you worked there after you graduated? Yeah, for a couple of years, then off to the service for two years. Okay. And then back. Okay. And that was just about my entire career until retirement, after which I became a management consultant. Uh oh. But during my time at Genrad, I began as a design engineer. Mm -hmm. We called them a development engineer, a circuit designer. Uh, later on became manager of custom products because many of our customers didn't want exactly the instrument we had made and catalog. Oh. We needed special versions mm -hmm. for one purpose or another. So I became uh, the manager of that department. So after being a development engineer for 10, Ten years, mm -hmm. I moved into the management ranks. We talked about the two ladders for an engineer. You could go up one ladder as an engineer or another ladder as a manager. 
Oh. After a certain extent, those are the two ladders for yeah. engineering graduates. Mm -hmm. So I jumped to the management ladder when I was appointed to manage the custom products operation. Mm -hmm. And I did that for, I forget how many years, and then I was promoted to vice president of engineering. Wow. And, I never knew all this. Yeah. Really? And that's right. For many years. And then I became a division manager. We began to separate it into different divisions. Oh, uh, the so, company separated? Yeah. Okay. So I was the VP first of the uh, instruments division. Then I was sent to California to be the director of an acquisition, Time Data Corporation, which made fast Fourier transform oh, wow. instrumentation in hardware form. Okay. And there I was the president, I guess. I ran the place. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay. And then after several years there, I was transferred back to work in the Concord plant, I believe, as a vice president. I became a senior vice president up there in the ranks, and my role was troubleshooter, really. Whenever an operation was in trouble, I would be assigned to help out. Okay. So from after my experience on the West Coast with that acquisition, which was in trouble when I went there, and I was able to stabilize it and make it profitable, it helped with the development of products. And they were making all kinds of special products, but they didn't have a product line. So I and my associates managed to get standard products designed and sold products for the testing of vibration, vibration analysis, okay. shape table software, and, and the fast Fourier transform, things of that nature. So we built the business up from losing money at seven million to making money at 12 million, something wow. like that. And I came back to the corporate headquarters in Waltham, where I was a oh, chairman. We, we divided ourselves up into boards of directors to handle the various separate uh, companies. We had the one in California, we had one in Arizona, we had a local acquisition in Massachusetts, and another one in England. So to manage these, our president established boards who could oversee these different uh, companies, and I was on a couple of them, I think. The one that included my California operation and an operation in Arizona. I was on that board, too. And then the man who was managing our Bolton operation, we had a separate plant in Bolton. His wife had health problems and they were interfering with his ability to manage. So I was sent out to take over that operation in uh, Bolton, Massachusetts. Component Test Division. Oh. And then managed that for a couple of years with the former manager, became my assistant, and we did very well. Mm -hmm. Then we added other product lines to it, quality QMP, quality management products, and began to develop more instruments, got into semiconductor testing. Okay. So we had a uh, a linear circuit tester, we had a digital component tester, we had a, a whole line of products, and I was the VP, and we did well. And that got expanded into a, instead of a division, it was called a group. So I had the component test division, the quality management products, the machine shop, 
fab and assembly, which made sheet metal parts and stuff like that. <laughs> so that was a group. We called it the Bolton Group. And I did that for several years. Then our acquisition in England oh, yeah. <laughs> got in trouble. Okay. An acquisition that wasn't doing very well. So I got sent to England to take over and calm things down. Although I was a semi-hatchet man, I had to fire the oh. president and founder oh. <laughs> and keep the other guys happy and calm. <laughs> And that was my skill, pour molasses over everything and just take it easy and see if we can't work our way out of this. And that was my particular skill level. Okay. And then came back, came back here to become the VP of quality, oh. corporate wide, and then retired. All right. And in retirement, I became a consultant worked with several different companies who had problems in outlying divisions. Uh, EG&G, Edget and Germershausen and Greer hired me for several jobs. <clears throat> they had acquired a crystal manufacturer, Quartz Crystals, out in the Midwest. So as, as a consultant, I went out there and helped them decide to fire the founder <laughs> and hire a different manager and get things back in control that way. Then I went to Oregon, Hard. consulting with another company there. Uh, I'll think of the name of it in a second. What was the name of that company? Support Technologies. Support Technologies. Yeah, they made test equipment similar to what we had at Genrad. And they had a marketing sales problem that I helped them with. Then the board of venture capitalists decided to fire the president. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And put me in as president. Really? Yeah. Of the company? Yeah. <laughs> so I did that for a couple of years, commuting from Massachusetts to Oregon. Shirley would come out and join me from time to time. Okay. That's how she knows how to say Oregon. Oregon. That's <laughs> correct. <laughs> Not Oregon. And then I had several other smaller jobs with different people. Oh, yeah. Keithley. Keithley Equipment hired me because they had an acquisition down in Norwood that oh. wasn't doing very well. So I con consulted there for a while and didn't fire the manager. Kept him on, but cut, no, actually, Maybe. actually he did get let go <laughs> after I was there, and I helped them find a replacement. Okay. And that was another of my assignments, and I gradually di drifted into complete retirement as the customers stopped calling me. <laughs> wow. So that's my management career. Oh my but, goodness. But it doesn't get get at the specifics of engineering management, which I'll talk to as you were. Okay. Um, how did you initially get promoted? Was it they decided that you were good at your job, so you were promoted from a design engineer? Or did you have to well, apply for No, I had, uh, I did many design jobs, and I had help some with custom products when customers uh, needed it. As a development engineer, I did that. Okay. And the custom products operation was not a an entity. It was scattered throughout the company. A couple of guys in manufacturing would make the stuff. A couple of guys in the drafting department would uh, draw it up. And s several engineers would contribute as the cases came up. But it was all spread out into different departments, so they decided to coalesce it as one particular operation because it was growing. More and more customers wanted it, and it was always a diversion from everybody else's main job. Mm -hmm. So it was decided to 
make it an entire unit with manufacturing personnel, draftsmen, and engineering designers and management. And I think my boss had detected some managerial ability somehow. You know, I wasn't completely nerdy like well, some of the sure. engineers. And I wasn't a complete glove and stomach face man like the sales engineers. <laughs> <laughs> Because I could understand the engineering, and better yet, I could communicate with the engineers, because mm -hmm. I was one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I could understand the, what they were saying, and furthermore, I could protect them from the upper management, which didn't know what the heck they were doing, <laughs> or couldn't understand them. Okay. So I understood them, which, which helped me help them but it also enabled me to know when they were trying to put something over on me. <laughs> okay. So to me, that's the engineering manager's skill. Mm -hmm. He can understand what the guys are doing, do, did it himself, knew what they were doing, mm -hmm. up to a point, because we had many specialists, and you couldn't do what the specialists could do, but you understood. Mm -hmm. And so you could protect them from the higher-ups but they couldn't put anything by you, <laughs> as some engineers could or would. Okay. So I was one of them, and yet at the same time could talk to the boss's bosses. So, uh, and to me, that's the skill of an engineering manager. Mm -hmm. Protect the troops from the higher-ups in the company who don't really understand, mm -hmm. and don't let the troops put anything by you. <laughs> Maybe overstated, but I think, in fact, you might talk to your brother because he's had some experience along these Probably. lines. And I think he functions pretty much now as sort of a manager. He, he's an individual contributor, mm -hmm. but he also, I think, is a group leader or lead. So I think he would understand completely what I'm talking about. Probably. Yeah, and it wouldn't be a bad guy to interview yeah, somewhere that's along true. the way. Because he sees it from a different viewpoint, and and in today's world rather than my older world. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Because he was going to be an English major, and you did the whole classical high school thing. Interesting. Isn't, isn't that interesting? Yeah. He, he switched also. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So on my list, it says, "What is your understanding of an engineering manager, and what sort of responsibilities does this role include?" And that's what you just addressed. So. Mm -hmm. Um, how is the role of a technical engineer different than an engineering manager? We kind of talked about that. Yeah. Well, the engineering manager doesn't really do anything. <laughs> it's the troops who are the uh, engineers. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Although the engineering manager, at least in some cases, could be one of the troops with his own specialty. Mm-hmm. So as you get further and further into engineering, into management, do you find that the technical people, they knew more than you did about like each product? Yes, no okay. question about but it. But never... We had technical experts who would know one phase of something extremely well. And it's interesting, uh, we had a guy, became a manager, and he had a way of describing that. He, he considered knowledge about anything was like an onion. Mm -hmm. And you could understand the outer layer of the onion, mm -hmm. or maybe two or three layers. Whereas the, the truly technical guy would understand many layers all the way down to the center. Mm -hmm. But he might be a little weak at such other things, uh, grosser, and you could you could pick out people by how many layers of the onion do they <laughs> understand. And I thought that was a great analogy. Yeah. That was Richie Fobio who came up with that. He was a development engineer who became a manager. Okay. And he could talk and explain to the higher ups, but he didn't know it all the way down. Okay. And some individual engineers would know it. Yeah. So it's depth versus breadth. Mm -hmm. The manager is broad. Mm -hmm. The engineer is deep, okay. so that's the yeah. 
and some guys can balance both. Pretty tricky, very hard to do. Mm -hmm. But having the breadth and the depth is, is great. So nowadays, any individual manager, I don't believe, can know in detail what the individual contributors do in their specialty. Mm -hmm. And that's probably especially true not only in my field of hardware, electronic hardware, but software as well. Yeah. There are some guys who will be expert at certain phases of software and others at putting it together and making sure it works with each individual piece. Mm -hmm. So did you have friends that like you started with at the company that stayed as design engineers that were more like introverted and... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a good way to look at it, maybe, but not completely. Some, some engineers were introverted in the sense that they weren't outgoing. And I have a very good friend, Henry Hall. Oh, Henry Hall. Henry Hall. Yeah, he's a, a very, successful guy. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's a brilliant <laughs> engineer. I mean, he could understand the onion all the way through mm -hmm. and develop things. And in fact, he was promoted to manager at one stage. But he was always uncomfortable. He didn't. He wasn't okay, yeah. comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, he opted to ask management to take him out of the job and put him back where he was happy, mm -hmm. back on the bench, which they did, and uh, picked another guy to manage the group. Oh. And uh, but he is what we all call the epitome of a, a true engineer. Mm -hmm. um, still is. He, well into his 80s, he still consults with. A company on different products because he knows it cold all the way down. But he's not as outgoing, pushy, mm -hmm. if you will, or as other guys like me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we appreciate each other and understand that. That's true. In fact, even now, Henry defers to me on certain things. Strangely enough, only because I was his boss somewhere along the line. <laughs> Henry right. does all the work, and I'm the face <laughs> man who gets the credit. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, great guy. Um, one point we'd like to consider is, do you think that management and leadership are different, um, are different skills to lead like a company Yeah, somewhere? yeah. Yeah, management is one thing. Leadership is, is totally different. A guy can lead a group without being the man in charge. Mm -hmm. you know, and that often happens. Yeah. Often. You know, the manager has his skills and his duties, but you know that the group as a whole, there's a leader in there. Henry, <laughs> case in point. People wanted to follow him? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Main, yeah. Main, main Wait, did man. he start his own company? He did, right? Started no. His own? No, he never no, did. No, oh. no. Oh, I'm thinking of Peter Williams. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, Peter Williams. <laughs> okay. Yeah, nice. Daniel's boss. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, he's, he's a case in point, and he's become a pretty good manager. Yeah. Even though he wasn't at work, he was a, uh, a development engineer. Individual contributor is the term used. Okay. Mm. As for a development engineer? An yeah. Individual well, contributor. Well, in, in, okay. yeah, it doesn't even have to be engineering. There are guys who are individuals. They don't manage a group, they, they, but they still do good work. Okay. Well, I think we're through with preformed questions. Anything else you would like to add? Any good anecdotes? Or... Wait, when did you go to Japan? That was just a trip? That wasn't like an assignment in Japan? Well, as a matter of fact, I did have an assignment there. I forgot that one. Okay. I thought you were just like meeting a boss or something. Well, I, we had, uh, the company had uh, representatives in Japan. We didn't, didn't have people who worked directly for us. We had another firm, a Japanese firm that would, uh, would sell our products and sometimes even design changes to them. So I would visit with that company several times in Tokyo and Japan, but then we also formed a joint venture owned by both my company, Genrad, and our Japanese representative. We formed uh, another unit, a joint venture, 
and I would go there from time to time. And I forgot one of my last assignments at GenRAD, <laughs> since there seemed to be a little difficulty there, was to... So I don't think I managed the joint venture, but... They wanted you to move to Japan. They did. Oh. They did. They did. <laughs> That's yeah. what I said. No. <laughs> All right. All right. So I might, just like any other assignment, England, uh, California, and later on Oregon, yeah, I was supposed to go to Japan and manage the joint venture, and I didn't. Mm -hmm. I'd forgotten that, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. But at least I was involved with it, so that was the <laughs> Japanese. Karen said no way. Well, no, but very important. For yeah, she did. <laughs> coming home from California, uh, Shirley's mother was ill, her sister had died. Oh, right. And there was a strong pull mm -hmm. to get back to the homeland, which we did. I right. think it was grandchildren were being born. Oh, yeah. There was that. I was born when you were in England, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. We were in England. Which when? 86? 86. April. April 14th of 1986. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And if you had said no to any of those traveling things earlier, like you had to go, it wasn't really an option when... No, like no, California. I was asked. You you're know, asked. Like, okay. You're pretty clear. You know, <laughs> if you didn't the go. president asked you. You, know. <laughs> you go. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the way it was. And how did you, did you buy like new houses? Um, yeah. You rented? Okay. No, no. Well, Sudbury, we owned the house where your mother grew up. We sold it. Mm -hmm. Moved to California, bought a house, sold it, came back here, and built this house. Okay. Yeah, no, we had lived moved. in a we condo. Were... Wow. Yeah, we had. Uh... Oh yeah, Nancy's Well, that would living in the condo was a step towards the building of the house. Yeah. Was understood. Okay. And I assume you got paid more when you moved. Well, part of it was just moving up, but yeah. managers get generally get paid more than an engineer. Yeah, yeah. And Depending that's... on. You know, certain engineers made a lot of money. You know, older guys who've been there a long time were well up. And in fact, that's the concept of the dual ladder. Mm -hmm. That you can go up this engineering ladder and make as much money oh. as the guy on the other one. Okay. Because otherwise it would be you're an engineer and then the managers make more money. Mm -hmm. Not, no. not you so. Can go up both. And, oh, sure. The dual ladder, they call it. Mm -hmm. And at least that's the way we manage things. Could you switch back and forth? I guess. Sure. Okay. Like Henry, Henry did. did. Henry okay. did. Yeah. I mean, it's not commonly done, but it certainly can be done. Sure. Yeah. And but management is different. You deal with different things, and uh, you, at least in design engineer, you could concentrate, and the you were dealing with things, mm -hmm. components, tubes, and they behaved the way they behaved. Mm -hmm. They didn't talk back to you. <laughs> sometimes they didn't do what you want, but that was, you were still able to do it. Mm -hmm. Management, you deal with people. people. And people are not things. That's true. They don't necessarily do what you wish they would do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's right, because <laughs> you might wish the wrong thing mm -hmm. and not know it, you know? Yeah. So management is much more dealing with people with the background of the technology, because that's the business you're in. Mm -hmm. But it's basically a people skill. Yeah. Getting the best out of a great engineer who might be rebellious or, or want to do it his way as opposed to what the team needs. Mm -hmm. See, it's the team that counts, getting the team to function together. And managers have to understand this. And if you've got a bad apple on the team, which often happens, then you've got to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to fire him. You hopefully find an assignment for him where his skills would work. Mm -hmm. But that's the task of a manager, to understand this and, uh, and value the good guys and somehow or other take care of the guys not so good that they don't screw things up. Mm -hmm. 
And in fact, there's a, uh, a thing I'll show you someday. I can talk about it. The von Moltke diagram. It's, uh, what do you call those things that have four squares? There's a word for that in math. I just can't come up with it. Like a sphere, only a square? Like? A square with four blocks in it. Oh. Oh, just... And you, and you can divide things into those categories quite often. Oh, oh, like a... But there's a word for that. Like a two-way table, you mean? Like mm -hmm. a... Yeah, but there's a, a single word that means that. That? Yeah. Okay. I'll come up with it somewhere along the line. Okay. But anyway, during World War I, I guess it was, there was a German general, von Moltke, and he had to manage a division, I guess, or a large group of, and he had to come up with ways of assigning the people in it. Oh. So he would evaluate the people and determine each one of them in a certain box of the four. Of the four, yeah. And the boxes were, or the axes were, active and passive. Mm -hmm. Some guys are quite active. Mm -hmm. Other guys, good guys, but they're passive. Mm -hmm. And then there was a, the other dimension was knowledge. Bright, not so bright. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you said bright and dumb, but it was... That was the thing. Active, passive, bright, not so okay. bright. Okay. And if you've got an active, bright guy, mm -hmm. that's the guy you promote. He becomes your leader, your colonel. Mm -hmm. If you've got a passive guy who's bright, He's very useful. He becomes a staff man. Yeah. So it was line and staff. He would staff. Mm -hmm. If you've got a guy who's not active and not so bright, he becomes a worker. Yeah. You can use him. He's not too bright and he's passive. He'll do what he's told. <laughs> if you've got a guy who's quite active and not so bright, you get rid of him <laughs> because he will Wreck things. Okay. So that's the von Moltke diagram. Really? And it's yeah. quite useful. So there are times in engineering manager when you come upon the very active guy who screws things <laughs> up and he must go. Mm -hmm. Then you have the leader, the guy who's bright and active, and he becomes the boss of that group. Huh. And the other guys, the bright active guys, the bright passive guys work for him. Mm -hmm. And the not so bright passive guys can do their work too. Okay. And that's how Mont von Moltke did his management. And I and I found that very useful anyway. Or it's a way of talking about it. That's true. Yeah. Okay. Were most of you'd say most managers engineering managers were extroverted, probably? Or does no. it vary? No. Well, Engineers in general, the are not very as well as the, uh, the workers are engineers. Engineers, so they're like yeah. nerdy. But, but in general, managers had to be a little more outgoing because they had to communicate with the bosses and with the other departments, the marketing department, the sales department, the production department, the drafting department. Mm -hmm. So you had to be a communicator. Mm -hmm. If you were really outgoing, those became the sales engineers. Oh yeah. Because they could sell you, they understood your product because they were engineers, mm -hmm. and they could go to customers and show the customer how to use it to do their job. <coughs> but they had to get along then with the customers. They had to be friendly. Yeah. Outgoing, good, good sales engineer as opposed to a salesman. A salesman. Typically, he's great with people, but he doesn't necessarily understand the product very well or what mm -hmm. it's going to do. He's got a, only a couple of layers of the onion. Mm -hmm. Sales engineer had a much better knowledge of the product as well as being able to communicate with the customer. Okay. Did you deal with financial stuff too? Like if a, I don't know, if a customer of yours called <coughs> and they wanted a special test, I don't know. You kind of go out of your way for bigger customers, like, oh, sure. well, and, and you knew when to do that and when. Oh sure, sure. 
went to do a dumb thing because the customer That's wanted right. it. So, okay, <laughs> he's the customer. But, but, uh, but as you go further up in management, you have to become more cognizant of finance and the finance department and how to measure your activity in terms of dollars. Mm -hmm. you know, so uh, finance is a whole separate skill, but the good managers become very proficient. They could communicate with the finance department. Mm -hmm. Different language, not, not engineering numbers, but uh, different language, profit, loss, assets, <laughs> liabilities, balance sheet, stuff like that, which I became very good at when you become a president of the company. Then you got to know all that stuff, mm -hmm. especially finance. Okay. So in the pre-internet days, did you just call people on the phone? <laughs> How did you? Pretty much. Or were they in your office? Well, in the office, office all the time. Yeah. When I was in Bolton, I had the Monday meeting. Mm -hmm. I'm the boss, the general manager, and my engineering manager, Bill Cable, <laughs> was in there, the manufacturing manager. The lady who ran human resources was there, mm -hmm. and the manufacturing guy. So once a week, we'd meet every Monday, first thing. How's it going? Were you having troubles? What should I know? Who's going to come and see me around your back? So we had the, man the OMG, the Operations Management Group, ah. and we'd meet oh, every geez. Monday as a group. And then I'd have individual meetings. The engineering manager would come in. We could then talk about different things that he wouldn't talk about in the group, you know. <laughs> and so, what what was the question? What what was the topic on what? that one? Oh, I just asked if you did you if you called people on the phone because it, it was all oh, pre-internet. No, yeah. And then, but you said no. You we had, had the email, office. but uh, you had email. Oh yeah. Well. <laughs> well. Something as the like years went by, computers <laughs> came to be used. Still, oh, that's interesting. in 1986. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. And in particular, though, they weren't self-standing. They were all part of a network. You had the mainframe. Oh, okay. And all these different terminals. Okay. So you could but send... strangely enough, that's the way the internet works now. <laughs> individuals. But we can send emails to one another. Oh. And, that, and the email would say, can you make the meeting on Tuesday? <laughs> yeah. But you didn't... Do much work by email. Okay. You work by face to face and hands on. But we had the, and you call on the phone. If I'm in California, you know, I'd call a boss in Massachusetts. Hey, I need help here. I need this, that, and the other. Or the boss would say, I need you back here on the monthly meeting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I spent many hours on, on that plane? airplane from <laughs> California. Yeah. Hence, many of my white wine poems. <laughs> what? You wrote poems on the airplane? Once in a while. I, write I have a couple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you do? You're on the plane, you know? Yeah. Pre smartphone. Plenty of hours on the plane. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Hmm. I'll have to find that white wine poem. Because one of my techniques, at least at the different divisions, was to publish a newsletter oh. of the operation. Mm -hmm. So people could contribute, no matter what their job was. Mm -hmm. And once a month out comes the public. I was looking at one of mine the other day that I did in Bolton, where the general manager has his paragraph, business is good, it's not so good, we met our goals, blah, blah, blah. Here's what's going to happen. And then other people, happy birthday to George and his <laughs> twins. And okay. picture of the party, mm -hmm. you know, the dance party and anniversaries and stuff like that. And, and that I found to be very valuable in making the group cohesive. Mm -hmm. You know, sharing a lot of things and knowing each other as opposed to this department, that department, that department. And back when I was a student, a co-op student, General Radio had a very valuable program 
they would take an MIT co-op and his first term he would spend going through the entire company, a week in this department, a week there, mm -hmm. learning manufacturing techniques and who the people were or in the office. And I found that extremely valuable later on, Be not only because I knew people there mm -hmm. and you could get things done, but I also learned that sometimes the product that you design in engineering you think is wonderful, it ain't so good out there when the guys are trying to build it. Mm -hmm. So they would ask questions, you could figure out how to do it. But otherwise, it was many companies, the engineers, quote, threw the design over the wall. Here's the design, <laughs> threw it over the wall. And the rest of the guys had to deal with it, bad or good. Whereas if you had cooperation, you could understand and make changes. Mm -hmm. Get a call from the lab. Hey, I can't calibrate this thing. And, you know, and you say, oh, well, maybe we should make some changes to make it easier. That was very valuable. Manufacturing. The guy said, how the hell can I put this capacitor under here when you got this thing coming over there? Oh, I didn't know that. I'll move it. Mm -hmm. So, and the draftsman would change the design. So I, I found it very important for an engineer and an engineering manager to understand what the other guys do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, extremely important. And nowadays we have this problem, the two young engineers who start a company mm -hmm. and don't realize it. Yeah, you got one that works. That doesn't mean you can make a hundred of them and they'll work. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you can't just throw it out to the customer and let him find the problems. So it's uh, and that happens quite often in the young startups. Yeah. You know, yeah. they're the two engineers mm -hmm. you know, and a salesman, maybe. <laughs> so the guy can build a couple, but he doesn't have the breadth of the other people, the manufacturing guy, the, all that stuff. So, very important. Mm -hmm. They rapidly learn because the uh, venture capitalist who gave him the money to start the company said, well, why don't we bring in this old guy? <laughs> you know, and help you out. Or bring in a finance guy. And usually that works. And they learn. Sometimes they don't. <laughs> so I bet you knew people in all departments. Yeah. And that was like a strength of yours. Like, because yeah. yeah. not all engineers would do that. Yeah. But yeah. Although that, that process made guys like that. Henry Hall went through the whole thing. I was behind him. Mac Holtz, we had lots of guys. MIT co-ops. Mm -hmm. And they had all gone through the uh, same process. I found it very valuable. They don't have, does MIT have that program anymore? Oh, you, sure. Can you do a five-year master's in co-op? I believe so. It was okay. course 6A. 6, a. six, six a. was electrical engineering and 6A was the co-op co program. Okay. Northeastern University is all co-op. They do yeah, all the time. they're not, big on it. Not as specific as that. They get you a job, but isn't quite as uh, right. It's as, as good as the one I had. Right. Yeah. But. Uh, and you applied to MIT just like you were good at. Like what was the thought? Oh, it was. It started in high school, the Jesuit high school. One of our priests, Father Krim, I guess it was. Started a radio club in high school. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, I joined the radio club. Oh. And because we had physics, physics was a course, and that talked about uh, radio. And radio didn't mean then what it means now. No, you, radio. You mean, no, then the radio club meant a, a radio. Yeah, that played. Yeah. And so we built our own. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, you, you built it. Yeah, you take the oatmeal box and wind the wire around it, and you get a general radio condenser, another word for capacitor, okay. and uh, a tube, and a battery, and you may, and you turn the knob, and you get a little loudspeaker, and you hear music. And that intrigued me, so I belonged to the radio club and understood what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And looking for a summer job one year, and our priest boss, I think it was Father Krim, he said, well, why don't you go over to MIT, over to, because MIT also had buildings where different operations went on. There was a so-called radio research laboratory, laboratory, where 
people work and design things. Go over there, maybe they can give you a job. Mm -hmm. So I'm just a kid. I forget, I'm 18, 17. So I go over there one day and wander around, went to this building, I had a name, and I saw the manager there. And I'm a kid, and he said, who are you? And I said, yeah, Father Krim told me to come over here, maybe get a job. <laughs> Who's Father Krim? <laughs> well, the radio club at uh, DC High. <laughs> oh, and what do you do? Well, we made these radios and all that. And I intrigued the guy. Oh, really? So he called in another guy and said, what do you think of this kid? Mm -hmm. Okay. So they hired me for the summer. <laughs> wow. So I, I worked there for the summer. But I think I had already applied to enter MIT. Oh, to But this was my summer job before being a freshman. Oh, okay. So I worked at Building 20. Building <laughs> 20. And other engineers there would have been. I was the, oh, call it a shop, an experimental shop, and the guy would give me a design and I'd build Builded. it for him, give it back to him. Cool. Yeah. Now that was pretty good. <laughs> that was great. But I had, I had applied to two colleges, Tufts mm -hmm. and MIT. And I forget what the tuitions were at the time, but I was looking for a scholarship and Tufts didn't offer me anything. Mm -hmm. MIT offered me 200 bucks. I said, well, that's easy. So <laughs> MIT. But that, I didn't know the difference. The difference between you know? the two, yeah. <laughs> so that's just by accident, I guess. I didn't have any father or uncle who had gone there or anything like that. I just kind of dumbed my way into it. Wait, did your parents go to college? No. Okay. No, to, so like was it kind of odd to apply to college or did they? Oh no, I was the fair-haired boy because my mother, I don't think she graduated from high school. My father only went to the fourth grade. Oh wow. And he had to work. Yeah. He, these were not, these were Irish immigrants. They weren't uh, wealthy people at all. Yeah. And I, my mother might have graduated, I'm not sure, from high school. But they were, then they had this kid, me, who turned out to be a smart kid. Mm -hmm. Good grades in the lower grades, so they were, they worked hard to, I this high sure. school I talked about cost money. It wasn't, I could have gone to Everett High free, oh. but they paid tuition for me to go oh. to BCI. Okay. At the advice of some of my teachers in the grade school who said, hey, this kid is smart, you ought to wasn't necessarily good for them. They had to right. strain and sweat and, and send me to uh, high school and then we'd take out loans to go to MIT, student loans. So it was a financial burden for my parents, a tough one. But they did it, you know, that I was the only child. And yeah, it's like you were one of the Chinese kids, you know how they have yeah. the one child and they put everything into it. Yeah, yeah. And then you like got a good job and made money when they were still around, right? So they realized their investment, like they were still alive when you were. Oh sure, sure. Yeah, my father died young, and my mother lived with us in Sudbury for a while. Oh okay. Yeah, and then she came to California with us. She oh really? Died out there. Oh. She was a smoker. Oh. Yeah, lung cancer. Not good. But they uh, sweated and strained to get me through school. Wow. I was a fair-haired boy. They were proud of me. Mm -hmm. So you just picked electrical engineering because that's what you were interested Well, I think it was that radio club and the summer job and uh, yeah. physics, being interested in the physics course. That's what got me into it. Mm -hmm. It was fascinating. And especially radio because it's... Radio waves are still magic. <laughs> well, magnetism. You can't see them. Yeah. That's right. You can't okay. see them. Hopefully, you can't feel them. Magnetism intrigued me. Mm -hmm. Action at a distance. Mm -hmm. Radio waves are especially fascinating because they travel through vacuum. I mean, I can understand sound. Mm -hmm. You vibrate in here and it moves the air molecules and bing, 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 they go over there. The radio waves going through the 
Magic. Going through nothing? Yeah. <laughs> Magic. And it's funny, and I thought I understood it all, Maxwell's equations, and mathematically we could determine it and understand and know how to make an antenna and this, that, and the other. But it's still magic. <laughs> it's still magic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And especially when I built that radio, and I remember in Everett, up my bedroom, I had the thing out on the bed. There was a, a board with the wires and stuff. And Frankie Honig, my buddy, whose name your mother will know, he came in and I showed him like, the battery you turn the knob and you hear music. Mm -hmm. And he was astonished, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, we had all known radios because our parents had them. You turn the knob and I'll, but to see it out there in the bed, a couple of pieces of wire, and yeah. hear the music. Yeah. It was amazing. <laughs> so in your class at MIT, there were no female engineers yet, right? Uh, yeah, there? yeah, there yeah. Were, oh, no, we had a couple. Really? Yeah, not many. They weren't 50% like now. Right. And especially... Especially not electrical. Yeah. Right, right? But, no, but in electrical we had two or three. Oh, really? Okay. One whose father worked with me in later years at uh, General Radio. Yeah. Okay. And, okay. Bousquet. And Annette Germain Bousquet. <laughs> so we had about two, mm -hmm. you know, but they were certainly uh, not many. And did any work at GenRad when you worked there? Or uh, you? Yeah, not so much as development engineers, though. We had uh, one young lady working sales promotion, writing instruction books and oh, okay. things of that nature. And she was a Tufts graduate, really? I believe. And Shirley and I know her to this very day. We do Tai Chi together. Really? Who is yeah. it? Carolyn O'Connor Birmingham. Married a Lincoln guy, lives in Lincoln. Huh. But she was our first woman engineer at General Radio because they were all male mm -hmm. engineers. But Carolyn broke the mold. Huh. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't have much business contact with female engineers or contact with women all through the place. Right. Your grandmother was the engineering librarian and oh, <coughs> finance department, personnel department, so that lots mm -hmm. of women working there. Mm -hmm. Not in manufacturing. That was all male, pretty much. The calibration laboratory, the machine shop, that was all males. Although, interesting, during World War II, oh. uh, the Neko Chocolate Factory across the street the women there, the chocolate dippers, were put to work making electronic equipment for the service. <laughs> so our guys at General Radio had to go over and manage them, set it up. And they called them the uh, the griefs, the GR Intermediary Emergency Force or uh, something, the griefs. <laughs> that was before my time. I was a kid in World War II, but I heard about it afterwards, the griefs and they called chocolate. And joining the army, that was required for you. Well, it, it uh, I might have been drafted. There was a draft uh, going on, but back at MIT, I joined the ROTC. Okay. And that, did they pay tuition? Like not to well, you got something. thirty bucks a month. Oh, so okay. It, it didn't hurt, but it didn't help. Okay. But part of the agreement was you go through your years in ROTC and you serve mm -hmm. a couple of years. In my case, the Army, because it was Army ROTC. So that was a foregone conclusion. Okay. But most of the guys did it when they first graduated. They'd graduate, go off for two years, come back. I went to work for General Radio, and newly married, and General Radio was able to get me a deferment for a couple of years, because they needed me. I was working on something that was important. So. I worked, I guess it was two years, Cheryl. We got married in 53. It was one year. One year, yeah. <laughs> so I worked for one year and then went in the service in 54, I believe. Yeah. And got out in 56, October, something like that. 
And did you do electric stuff in there? Yeah. Okay. Because of my background, oh, you got to do. I was assigned to the signal core engineering laboratories. Oh. Down in Fort Monmouth, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Oh. Signal core. In, I was signal core. <coughs> and my assignment was to work in the laboratories as an engineer. Oh. So that's what you did. You never went like out. No. Into. Pedals. Well, we had our well, I, we had our training, all right. I oh, the basic training. Okay. Shotguns and. Okay. We had a summer camp before going in, mm -hmm. and that was pretty bad down in Georgia. Oh, <laughs> we, we paid the dues. Oh. We knew all about that, but I didn't fight in a war. With okay. It was all training, not anybody. Just because of the training. time, there was no war. That's right. Okay. I lucked out. I was between wars. Uh, Slightly after Korea and shortly before Vietnam. Okay. So, in there, although it's funny, I'm considered a veteran of either one, depending <laughs> on uh, what the reason is, because of the cutoff. Eh? Yeah. Oh. <coughs> yeah. I'm either a Korean vet or a Vietnam vet, and I, I haven't looked at that for years to see what it means. But no, I spent my two years stateside. Okay. That's what they say, stateside. Stateside. Yeah. And in particular at the engineering laboratories. And I was an officer. When you're out of DC, you're okay. an officer. Right. Went in as a first lieutenant, get promoted, as a second lieutenant, get promoted to first lieutenant after 18 months or so, and then discharged. Is that why you did ROTC? What was the motivation to do it? With the 30 bucks a month? Or the well, that was a part of it, but uh, I don't know. It's what you did. Okay, you know, people did it? Yeah, <laughs> because in those days, maybe not so much now, people were patriotic. Oh, okay, you know? right. You know, yeah, the, no. company, the country needs me, and mm -hmm. I need the country. And okay. World War II, I had several uncles in the service. One, two, three. Three of my uncles were in the service, and uh, that's the kind of family we were. Okay, you know? that's like what you did. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't think people. So it's that's right. That's right. Now ROTC, I think they pay some sort of tuition. Like it's a, a lot of it's financial. Why yeah. people do it? Oh sure, sure. Well, that was a part of it, but that wasn't the major motivation. It's what you did. And I actually enjoyed it. I mean, I, uh, I valued my time in the service. I learned a lot there. You learn a lot about management. <laughs> because, of course, the service is very precisely organized. And mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess all my career I've been kind of management bosses. And sometimes this is not so good. The other night I went to a meeting and I wasn't running the meeting, but I did. <laughs> and finally the guy was running it said, well, Harold, we appreciate all that, but we got to get on here. <laughs> and I realized I was, couldn't help myself. Okay. You know, once you get that manager, then you manage. You manage stuff. And that happens around here, too. That's true. You know? <laughs> Till you run up against something. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Some people are extremely hard to manage. <laughs> they, don't, they don't take the fact that you're trying to help them. <laughs> oh, well. All right. But that's mostly me we're talking about here. I'm sorry about that. This is supposed to be an mm, interview to learn. Not really. I know about the no. engineering manager. I can just tell you what I did. No, our professor said to like tell this person's story and yeah. and kind of tie in management. It was just. Yeah. She even said we could interview a scientist. It wasn't. But yeah, yeah just. Was, but I hope you do. I hope you try somebody who isn't a close relative. You know. Oh, like a. Um, stranger. Someone I don't know. Stranger. Oh, okay. If, you know, or somebody that you only know casually through somebody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, so we'd like to thank our guest, Mr. Harold McAleer, formerly of General Radio and Associated Consultancies, uh, for joining us today. Well, thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. 
and I wish you the best. All right. <laughs>